A monk by the name of Brother Lawrence, living in the 17th century, spent much of his life working in the monastery kitchen. One day, he's scrubbing pots and pans and he has this epiphany. It didn't matter whether he was doing the dishes or peeling potatoes or praying in the chapel. Anytime and everywhere, God was nearby. He could be engaged in the most mundane or menial task, but he could still connect with God in a real way. See, Brother Lawrence discovered that our specific circumstances don't determine God's proximity. And if we want to feel his nearness anytime and anywhere, all we have to do is practice his presence. See, we could be washing a dish or we could be going for a walk, and all we have to do is intentionally acknowledge God's presence. See, Brother Lawrence, he developed this thinking into a book, which is now a Christian classic called Practicing the Presence of God. See, practicing the presence of God, it prompts us to an awareness of God at any time and everywhere. This has now been a constant force within the church for hundreds of years as modern Christians have sought to draw close to God regardless of their circumstances by simply practicing His presence. Practicing the presence of God, it, it seems like this holy thing to do, such a spiritual thing to do, such a godly thing to do. But did you know that it's just as holy, just as spiritual, and just as godly to practice the presence of people? What would it look like to practice the presence of people? What would it look like to have a heightened awareness to the, the presence of people in our lives? Well, today, as we continue in our Invitations from God series, we're going to be unpacking God's invitation to you to practice the presence of people. Now, before I lose half of you right off the bat, let me just quickly address one thing. Practicing the presence of people is not just for extroverts. I know all you introverts out there are like, no, what a week to watch church online. Stupid Simon's going to make me go out and make friends with a stranger or something now. Now, I don't know about you, but my entire life I've been told I'm an extrovert, okay? I love being in front of people. I love making people laugh, hanging out with friends, going on adventures. And then the pandemic hit, okay? I found myself interacting with a very small circle of people and I was quarantined in my home with my family and I loved it. I started to realize that maybe I'm not such uh, the extrovert that I thought I was. So now I'm just confused. I don't know what I am anymore. Perhaps I'm an omnivert. So to all you introverts out there and my fellow omniverts, trust me on this. I'm not going to make you uncomfortably shake hands with a stranger or anything like that. See, practicing the presence of people isn't about being a social butterfly. It's about being invited to see people as Jesus sees them. If you're following along on your outlines, when it comes to practicing the presence of people, consider that God has invited you to see people as Jesus does, as the most important things in the world. See, the Gospels are filled with stories of Jesus, Jesus who saw people. See, no one was invisible or beneath his attention. No one was fading into the background when Jesus was around. No one was written off as hopeless or disgusting. He never categorized people as they're none of my business or they're not my type. See, Jesus constantly practiced the presence of people. He practiced the presence of, of beggars and women, soldiers, tax collectors, vagrants, religious folk, disenfranchised people, lepers, scholars, children, everyone. See, people were never just interruptions that got in the way of his mission. People were his mission. See, people weren't just a, nu a nuisance to Jesus People were the reason that Jesus came. And now, God invites us to begin to see people as Jesus does, as the most important things in the world. The Gospel of Luke tells us about a time when Jesus is at this party in this house of one of the religious elites known as a Pharisee. His name was Simon. No relation. An unnamed woman who was known for her sins comes up to Jesus and does something incredible. Now, can you just imagine for a moment what it would be like to be known for your sins? Oh, look, there goes Lance the Luster. I can't see him. Where is he? Oh, he's just behind Gertrude the Gossip and, and right next to Sarah the Self-Righteous. You know, 
standing next to Daryl the drunk. Like, that would be crazy. It would be awful to be known by your sins. And this woman's sin was so renowned that there wasn't a person at the party that didn't know who she was. Possibly a sin so vile that Luke, the author, as an act of grace, doesn't even dare to mention her by name or what she's done. So, this sinful woman, she knows her state. She knows the gravity of her sinful ways. And she recognizes that she's incapable of saving herself. So in total desperation, she falls to the feet of Jesus and a steady stream of tears begin to flood from her eyes and, and she begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and she begins to dry them with her hair. It's this beautiful moment of such of repentance and, and deep humility. And Jesus sees her. He truly sees her, all of her. He sees her brokenness. He sees her desperation. And Simon, the Pharisee, who has a front row seat to all of this, he, he misses it all. He, he can't see past her sins. He can't see past her reputation. He, he, he can't see the woman for who she is. And, and so Simon turns to Jesus and, and he looks at Jesus disgustingly and he thinks to himself, if this man was the prophet that I thought he was, he would know what kind of woman would be is throwing and falling all over him. Now, this would have been a great opportunity for Jesus to begin to teach on the ethical principle of the equal treatment of all people or, or for Jesus to teach about a moral value like humility. But instead, Jesus launches into this discussion about finances. See, Jesus was going to point out this, this first century banking practice to help Simon see, to help him see what was really going on, to help him see this woman for who she really was. See, Jesus was so good at that. He was so good at getting people to see reality for what it was. So Jesus says to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Oh, tell me. Two men were in debt to a banker. One owed 500 silver pieces, the other 50. Now neither of them could pay up, so the banker canceled both debts. Which of these two would be more grateful? Simon answered, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. That's right, Jesus said. Then turning to the woman, but speaking to Simon, he says, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You provided no water for my feet, but she rained tears on my feet and dried them with her hair. You gave me no greeting, but from the time I arrived, she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing for freshening up, but she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive, isn't it? She was forgiven many, many sins, and so she is very, very grateful. If the forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. Then he spoke to her, I forgive your sins. I love that Jesus turns to the woman and asks Simon, do you see this woman? She was right there sitting in front of him, but he couldn't see her. She was physically in his presence, but he refused to practice her presence. How often are people physically in our presence, but we refuse to practice their presence? See, Jesus invited Simon to look past his first impressions, to practice this woman's presence. Jesus invited Simon to begin to pay attention to the sad and untold story behind this woman's tears. Jesus invited Simon to see her as he did, as the most important thing in the world. So why people? Why are people the most important thing in the world to Jesus? Because Jesus sees the extrinsic value placed on every soul. Jesus knows that every person was created in the image of God. And regardless of your sins, your status, or your struggles, Jesus can see the image of God in you. Perhaps you're watching this today and, and you don't feel very image of God-y. Okay, I get it. Maybe you've never actually thought of how Jesus really sees you right now. Well, you were created by the God of the universe. You are the pinnacle of his creation. You were designed in the image of God. His very nature has been stamped onto your soul. And regardless of your sins, your status, or your struggles, Jesus can see the image of God in you right now. Jesus sees you. He sees all of you. And just as Jesus saw the woman who was known for her sins, 
and he was able to forgive her and accept her today. Jesus sees you, all of you, and is offering you forgiveness and acceptance today. I'm going to give you a chance at the end of today's message to simply respond to this Jesus who sees you. You can start to gear up for that right now. Okay, so practicing the presence of people begins with seeing people the way that Jesus does, noticing them for who they truly are, seeing the image of God in them, and giving them your full time and attention. Now, you know who's figured this out? Who's figured out how to practice the presence of people better than anyone else in our world? People from Guatemala, okay? (laughs) I've been to Guatemala three times, and every time I go, I am amazed at how good people are there at seeing people. See, people are the priority, not the time, not the schedule, not the work. People. See, spending time with people, helping people in need, it trumps whatever else is on the agenda for that day. A situation may arise where someone needs help, and you simply drop what you're doing, and you help. This happened almost every day when we were in Guatemala that we actually started to plan a buffer into our schedule so we could start to prepare to focus on others and actually practice the presence of people like the Guatemalans. See, I've heard it said that people from warm climate countries, they focus on people first. And people from cold climate countries, they focus on task first. So if you're from a warm climate country, you may know this dynamic of seeing people. You know this very well. But here in this cold climate Canada, our mindset is so focused on task that our life is so scheduled that every minute of our day is pre-planned. Not only do we not stop and help very often, but half the time, we don't even see the person in need. Our lives are so go, 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 go that we, we've become blinded by our calendars. Our culture, it holds the value of productivity over people. But Jesus sees people as the priority. See, Jesus invites us to see people as he does, as the most important things in the world. Now, this is not to say that you can't keep a tight calendar, you can't measure growth or track progress or anything like that. But I think there's a way that we can do that, that it doesn't consume us. I think there's a way forward that we can still see people as Jesus does. We can still check all the boxes on our to-do list. We can still hit our monthly targets and complete our yearly goals. But we can do this with others in perspective. As your outline says, truly seeing people means going out of your way to love them. Truly seeing people means going out of your way to love them. And Let's just be honest for a moment when it comes to loving others. It's not easy. Loving costs us something. Love is not this superficial or this conceptual or theoretical thing. Love is practical. Love is intentional. And I don't know about you, but there are some people in my life who are really hard to love. So that begs the question, can can we actually love someone that we don't like? Can we love someone that we don't like? Now, these terms, like and love, have taken on this whole new meaning to me as I get older. See, when I was in grade school, I had friends that would tease me about girls that I liked. And and if they thought I liked someone, they'd be like, Oh, Simon, you like (laughs) so-and-so. And if they thought I really liked someone, they'd be like, No. Simon loves (laughs) so-and-so. It's almost like like was the lesser version of love. Like was love's junior high expression, so to speak. Like was the baseline, and then love was the special attribute that went on top of like. Now, as a pastor and a father and and a husband, I'm starting to see these two words in a whole new light. Let me explain. I love my wife, okay? Let me just say that. I love my wife. When I got married, I got to experience what love really meant. Love, it's a commitment more than a chemistry. Love, it's a choice more than a feeling. And I am absolutely convinced that my wife loves me, okay? Nothing will ever change that. But sometimes I'm pretty sure she doesn't like me, okay? I can be pretty hard to like sometimes. See, I'm messy, 
I am smelly. I am selfish. I put my almost dirty clothes next to the hamper rather than in it because they still have one more wear in them, okay? I leave the toilet seat up and I blame it on my boys. I forget to shut cupboards and drawers. Uh, I'm a procrastinator. Okay, the list goes on and on and on. And I'm sure if Ashley was sitting here, she would have a field day with all of my unlikable habits. So when it comes to these words like and love, it's almost like a reversal has happened. See, love has become the baseline. Love has become the constant. And then like has become the special attribute we put on top of that. Ashley will always love me. But at times, she has to work really hard at liking me. And that brings me to the big idea for today. See, God commands us to love people. He doesn't command us to like people. God commands us to love people. He doesn't command us to like people. Someone watching this today, you, you may need to hear this. Liking people is not a prerequisite to loving them. See, God commands his people to love others. He doesn't command people to like people. You don't have to be best friends with someone to show them dignity and respect. You don't have to like someone to honor them, to honor them with your time, with your attention and your care. See, not liking someone is never an excuse to refuse to see the image of God in them and treat them with love. God commands us to love people. He doesn't command us to like people. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And if we're going to truly love others, we must begin to practice their presence. And I know that practicing the presence of people is hard work because I fail to love daily. I can't tell you how many times I've been introduced to someone new and then I've forgotten their name whilst I'm still talking to them, okay? I'm physically in their presence, but I'm not practicing their presence. When I'm busy trying to complete a task and someone comes up to me and they interrupt me, my reaction usually isn't gracious and kind but rather annoyed or frustrated. See, I'm physically in their presence, but I'm not practicing their presence. And when I fail to practice the presence of people, I fail to love them. When Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. He ended that statement by saying this. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So love really becomes the litmus test of the Christian faith. There's no escaping this. If you want to see others the way that Jesus does, you must love. You see, God knows the different temperaments that we all have, the different personality types that he's given us. He's created some of us to be extroverts, some of us to be introverts, still others to be omniverts, okay? But he still doesn't modify his invitation to love. Right? And even though loving people is hard, we're still commanded to do it. Uh, listen to how author Eugene Peterson describes this whole loving people ain't easy to do dynamic in his own life. He says this, Every day I put love on the line. There is nothing I am less good at than love. I am far better in competition than in love. I'm far better in, at responding to my instincts and ambitions to get ahead and, and make a mark than I am at figuring out how to love another. I am schooled and trained in acquisitive skills, in getting my own way, and yet I decide every day to set aside what I do best and attempt what I do very clumsily opening myself up to frustrations and the failures of loving, daring to believe that failing in love is better than succeeding in pride. All this is hazardous work. I live on the edge of defeat all the time. So if you're like me, if you're like Eugene Peterson, you know that we all can be pretty clumsy at love. We can be pretty bad at practicing the presence of people. And yet Jesus still invites us to try. He still invites us to do our best, to continue to put aside our wants for the needs of others, to continue to lay down our own interests for the sake of someone else. So, we're patient. We're kind. We do not boast. We are not rude. We love others. 
So practically, how do we do this? How do we get good at practicing the presence of people? How do we truly start to see people? How do we truly start to love people? Now, this might just sound obvious, but I think it's worth mentioning. Practicing the presence of people takes practice. If you want to get better at anything, you need to practice. No one is good at something right away. Be patient with yourself. Practice these things. Practice the presence of people. The next thing is practice being attentive to the needs of others. Now, this means getting your Guatemala on, okay? This means putting people before task. Ask yourself, who is it that's around me and what are their needs? Start to be attentive to the needs of others. Okay, next. Practice noticing things about others. Notice that someone got a new haircut. See people. Notice if they got a new pair of glasses. But I should note this about noticing things about people. If you ever notice that someone is tired, <laughs> this is something you don't have to acknowledge. I thought this was common knowledge, but I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, you look tired. That's never a good thing, okay? So just let people looking tired, let that one go. Okay, the next, the next practice. Practice really listening to people when they speak to you. Now, this one I'm actually pretty bad at. My, my brain is always working 100 miles a minute. And when people are talking to me, I find myself thinking about my response. I, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, and I stop listening to what they're actually saying. So when people speak to you, don't be thinking about your rebuttal or your response. Just listen well. Next. Practice putting your phone away, okay, or any other distraction when you're with people. <laughs> okay, I know I said I was bad at that last one, but I'm really bad at this one. Think of the times where you're in a meeting and your phone is sitting on the table next to you. Is your phone sitting face up so you can see all the text messages when they come in and calls? Is your phone face, uh, face down on the table? How about you take your phone and don't even put it on the table. Just put it away in your pocket. Put it in your bag. Put it in the other room when you're with people. Okay, next. Practice not holding back your words of encouragement. Do you know how many positive thoughts we have about someone, but we never say it? Wow, they did such a good job, but we don't say it. Wow, they sure poured a lot of work into that presentation, but we don't acknowledge it. If I didn't know any better, I would think that we were scared to compliment people on a job well done. When you have an encouraging thought, say it. Just get it out there, say it. Next, practice the simple act of slowing down and being present. See, being present simply means being hyper aware of your surroundings and your feelings at any given moment in your daily life. So rather than, than wandering, you know, you're having your mind wander from here or there, rather than living in fear of the future of what's coming next or, or being anxious of the past of what's already happened, simply be present in the moment that you're in. Now, all of these things, they aren't easy and they do take practice, but all of these things will help you begin to see people the way that Jesus does. They'll help you begin to love people the way that Jesus does. Jesus has invited us into something special. Just like he invited Simon the Pharisee to see the woman who is known by her sins, he's invited us to begin to practice the presence of those around you. And just as Brother Lawrence was able to hone his skill in practicing the presence of God as he washed the dishes in the monastery kitchen, we too can take up this holy and worthy invitation of practicing the presence of people. We practice the presence of people as we begin to see others as Jesus did, as the most important things in this world. Would you pray with me as we close? Today, maybe as we close right now, maybe you're here and, and you never knew that Jesus could see you for who you really are. All of your failures, all of your shortcomings, all of your faults, Jesus sees you right here, right now. And he's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. He simply wants you back. He sees the image of God in you, his very nature stamped on your soul. So if that's you today and you simply want to come back to him, you want to turn from your ways and ask Jesus to be the leader of your life and the forgiver of your sins from this day forward, would you pray this prayer with me right now as we close? Jesus, 
I accept you for who you are, and I thank you for seeing me, all of me, for who I really am. God, I know that I haven't lived a life according to your design, but from this day forward, I want to be known as a child of God. Come live within me by your Holy Spirit and teach me what it means to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, everyone said together, amen. Amen. Now, as we close, if you prayed that prayer with me, the best advice I could give you is to text the number on the screen right now. We have a pastor standing by who would love to text with you and and pray with you and give you your next best steps in a real relationship with the God of the universe. Well, thank you for joining us today in our series, Invitations from God. Join us next week as we continue on in this series as we receive the next invitation from God.